Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Lieutenant General Bob Wood, U.S. Army retired, Executive Vice President of AFSIA. Thank you very much. We will certainly uh, continue. We'll have follow-up on that presentation. We thank SAIC. Uh, we'll get the, get the timing right. Uh, we're very thankful that you're here this morning with us today on day two. Uh, we're very pleased and happy to bring a program that talks about uh, our theme and ready today, modernize for tomorrow. How can we maintain the edge? Yesterday was a full day of a great presentation to kick off Admiral Stavridis, who set the framework, our strategic framework, and asked a number of very pertinent questions. Uh, we look forward to seeing him in person tomorrow, in fact. He'll be back. He'll be with us. Uh, but we also had uh, the type commanders speak. We had fleet commanders uh, at panel sessions, but we also had a number of uh, technology presentations at the uh, Solution Showcase Theater and a variety of activities that went on in our West Theater. Uh, happy to see our young AFCNs uh, present a fantastic panel focused on really cyber and cybersecurity as, as a, a perspectives that were, I think, informative and unique. We're thankful that they joined us for that panel. Once again, we're thankful you're back uh, today, and we hope that you'll find today uh, as interesting, compelling, and thought-provoking as yesterday. A great way to start this morning is with our first keynote speaker. And uh, we have known uh, Admiral Winnefeld for uh, a long time in his service and now post-service in his activities uh, in industry and academia. Uh, his last posting started Georgia Tech, a great engineer, uh, a great avi aviator, naval aviator with command tours. I'll count in a minute, but we really knew him best as his last position, ninth Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, where he could look across all programs, all requirements, all needs, and with a joint perspective and an understanding as a warfighter, put the priorities in place and allow uh, our systems to work, uh, our procurements to proceed, and our mission to be continued. Uh, his commands did involve a number of uh, at, uh, at sea commands. Uh, he was with the Enterprise uh, when 9-11 occurred, commanding the Enterprise uh, in the Persian Gulf frankly, heading out of the Gulf, about ready to, to make their way home when 9-11 uh, occurred. Uh, that was a, a U-turn, went back, had presence, and launched, starting in October, uh, some of the very first uh, flights in, in uh, OEF. As a commander of the Carrier Strike Group 2, Theodore Roosevelt Carrier Strike Group, in fact, uh, he was involved in OIF, and he was a commander of Sixth Fleet a variety of commands at sea, and in sure, equally interesting work, where he worked in a number of joint billets uh, on the joint staff. Director J-9, that's where I first got to know Admiral Winnefeld, uh, where he was my relief at Joint Forces Command in innovation and experimentation, where he brought far more energy and creative and, uh, insight than I ever could provide uh, and, and brought it into a joint setting. From that, he went on to jobs. Uh, uh, at that case, he was off to Sixth Fleet, uh, but uh, he also returned to the building, director J-5, commander finally in NORTHCOM and NORAD, and as I mentioned, final position in the joint world. Last 10 years really working in the joint, the joint world as vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Living now in McLean, we're glad his wife Mary is with us today. Now there's some serious critique going on there. We understand that, uh, but we're glad, very glad you're with us. Uh, Mary's uh, involved with uh, veteran, veteran causes and veteran needs. Uh, very happy for this couple to be with us today. Right now, Sandy's working in, uh, in a variety of boards and advisory and board positions, but also uh, a key contributor in academia, uh, where he's involved in Georgia Tech and Harvard and other areas, where he's helping to shape the arguments, really helping shape the generation that's thinking about our security issues. We're very pleased and happy to have this naval leader with deep joint perspectives, international and alliance insights, uh, with uh, the work ahead of us, uh, it's important to have his expertise and insight. Please help me welcome Admiral Winnefeld to our stage. Thank you, sir. All right, good morning, West. I hope you're maintaining the edge this morning. And uh, thank you, Bob, very kind introduction. Uh, Bob not only was my boss, but my neighbor as well. And uh, I wouldn't go so far as to say I was more creative than he was. I inherited a really interesting job uh, when I took over from him in the J-9. Uh, it's really great to be here this morning. It's great to be back in San Diego. 
I was born here, uh, commanded a fighter squadron here, commanded a ship here, and most importantly, uh, I met my wife here of uh, a number of years. So this town's been very, very good to me. I had to say that, of course, because she's here. If she weren't here, I wouldn't say it. Just kidding. Uh, but the town's been really, really good to me, and it's always terrific to be back here, and particularly at such a great venue. Um, and it's great to be part of this event and to be able to run into some old friends while I'm here. Uh, and AFSIA has always been instrumental in bringing industry partners together, and we would not have the finest military in the world were it not for our fantastic industry partners. And it goes without saying that the Naval Institute has always been first in class among a strong field of institutions that not only supports but also challenges our military. So many thanks to everyone who uh, helped put this together and who also has invested the time uh, to be here this week. It's great. Uh, I thought I'd talk about this morning um, from the perspective, as Bob mentioned, as somebody who had around 10 or 11 years of joint duty, uh, who was privileged to sort of be at the, among the, uh, the trifecta or the three-legged stool of requirements, uh, acquisition, and budgeting, and who also attended around 1,200 White House Situation Room meetings in two different administrations. Sort of from that perspective, um, to tell you about what I think is an ongoing disruption in our national security landscape and what we might consider doing about it. Um, disruption occurs when something happens that upends entire belief systems and fundamentally reshapes or in some cases takes down entire institutions. Normally after such a disruption, organizations look back and they realize that the evidence pointing to the change was there all the time, but it was fitted to a prevailing concept rather than generating an entirely new concept. Examples abound, such as our recent financial crisis or the destruction of Polaroid and Kodak by the advent of the digital camera, which I was here, pleased to hear Harry Harris re refer to yesterday. It's all over the place in biology. It happened here in San Diego when Dennis Conner changed the entire paradigm of the America's Cup 30 years ago, beating a monohull boat with a catamaran. And it happened at Pearl Harbor 75 years ago. Historical change can be difficult to see when you're actually living through it. But that kind of disruption may be exactly what's happening to us today. If so, it's because of the turbulence within the four strategic variables that we have to keep in balance if we're to be secure, namely ends, ways, means, and the security environment. And whenever one of those variables falls out of whack, one or more of the other variables has to be adjusted in order to maintain the equilibrium. And I would suggest to you that all four are out of whack today, and that is pretty dangerous. I'd also suggest that our military only really directly affects one of those variables, namely our ways, which is what we do with the means that we're provided by the people of this country. If we're to do our part, and by we I mean those of us in industry, retired, active duty, you name it, if we are going to um, restore the strategic balance to maintain the edge, we have to work much harder than we are at what some would call the third horizon of innovation. It's what Harry Harris yesterday called exponential thinking. This in turn is gonna demand fresh intellectual energy from our people, both in the military and industry, to face some hard realities, to merge completely new concepts with new technologies, and then forcefully put the resulting solutions into place. That's what I believe, and it's what I want to tell you about today. So fasten your seatbelts, and let's start with the first variable I mentioned, the security environment. Now this sophisticated audience understands that while our nation has faced far more dangerous times, we've, we've rarely, if ever, seen a time, an environment that is this complex and dynamic. Jim Stavridis took us on a great tour at Horizon yesterday of the many threats that we face Russia, China, Iran, North Korea, violent extremism, all of them lurking on a choppy sea of globalism and population growth and climate change and the information revolution. There are at least two factors in this environment that I pay very close attention to. The first is what our competitors are really trying to do to us strategically. None of these threat actors have both the capability and the intent to directly challenge the United States kinetically on a large scale. Some have the capability, some of them have the intent, 
but none have both, at least for the moment. Rather, they're going after what this baby boomer calls, in a nod to the millennial generation, the global operating system, the system of alliances and rules, laws, norms, standards, values, democratic principles, agreements, and organizations that our opponents dislike so much. This system is in place, by the way, because our other generation, the greatest generation, experienced, as Jim Stavridis again said yesterday, two terrible wars and a Great Depression in the first half of the last century, and they were determined to never let that happen again. So it convinced them to establish a system like that in order to prevent those things from happening. And they did a pretty good job. Candidly, it's something that most Americans either don't understand or they just take for granted. But it's kept us out of open, hot, major power conflict and led to unprecedented prosperity for this nation and our partners for over 70 years. This system is under attack, and it'll only last as long as we are willing to hold it together, which we do through five catalysts, credible diplomacy, security guarantees, free trade, rule of law, and our values. If these are allowed to atrophy or fail, either through ignorance or through intent, the system's glue starts to dissolve. Our partners start to hedge their bets, and our adversaries enjoy what Henry Kissinger called the patient accumulation of advantage. We're seeing this now, Russian interference in ours and other elections, China actively filling a vacuum created by emerging U.S. protectionism, Iran routinely violating Security Council resolutions, and these are only just a few examples. My second concern about the security environment is how our adversaries are actually evolving to challenge us on the battlefield, especially our most capable opponents, who did not stand idly by while we committed to counterterrorism operations. These adversaries evolved a blend of conventional, irregular, political, economic, legal, and information warfare into a cohesive campaign, some would call hybrid warfare, to outpace an opponent's will and ability to respond to aggression. They've thrown away the rules, and we're not ready for it. They've also watched us closely and either copied or outright stole much of the military technology and tactics we developed in what some call the second offset. Worse, they invested in things we actually haven't been doing, including asymmetric ways to counter us in domains in which we have been very comfortably accustomed to having unfettered access over the last 15 years. Well, sensor capability and weapons lethality has now evolved to the point that wherever finders have the advantage over hiders, you really don't want to be a hider. But that's where a good chunk of our stuff operates today. Let's face it, there aren't many of us in this room who have ever faced a sea-skimming, supersonic, weaving anti-ship cruise missile with a sophisticated multi-mode seeker and its own digital radio frequency modulation jamming. And that's not to mention almost daily reports in the media of uh, threat advances in anti-satellite and anti-submarine cable capability, offensive cyber, anti-ship ballistic missiles, long-range air-to-air missiles, and other technologies that are raising the bar even further. And the result for us is what we now label with the long-known buzz phrase, anti-access and area denial. And we're on the backside of the curve. So the variable we call our security environment isn't looking so good right now. But there are three other variables in the strategic balance I mentioned. So what about our ends? Our ends are our national security interests. And the choices we make about which ones we feel we need to protect or advance and which ones we don't. We may be living through some historical changes among those choices. At the highest level of strategic thinking, our security interests have to be expressed in enduring and abstract language. Otherwise, it's too tempting to use that term in undisciplined and expedient ways, which happens a great deal. Moreover, our interests need to be prioritized so that we don't try to do too much with too little. In my personal view, these high-level interests, five of them, should guide our choices. The first is the survival of our nation. The second is the prevention of catastrophic attacks on our nation and its people. 
Third is the protection of the U.S. and global economic systems. Fourth is ensuring that we have secure, confident, and reliable allies and partners. And fifth is our values, which are a strategic asset in and of themselves. I would ask you to note that the last three essentially constitute the global operating system I talked about a moment ago. Now, our national leadership can use a list of interests like this in several ways. First, they can guide wise policy judgments regarding whether and when and how to use the instruments of national power, including force. And second, we can use the list to help guide security investments based on an assessment of risk inside each interest in terms of the gap between threat and our ability to mitigate it. Now, the five interests I, I outline actually roll up into two kind of pillars, right? One is the physical defense of our nation and its people and their prosperity. And the second one is, as I said, the global operating system, which reflects the middle and lower op uh, items on the list. Now, for all of the understandable criticism that President Obama received for a cautious approach to global leadership, he realized that both of these pillars are in play and they're interrelated and he factored all of them into his decision making. Our new president's approach, America First, on the other hand, appears to place almost exclusive focus on the first pillar at the expense of the second. And I am not making a political judgment there. It's just what he has expressed to us. And that includes challenging the five catalysts I outlined a moment ago, diplomacy, alliances, free trade, democracy, and values. In their defense, Perhaps the president's closest advisors are advocating trimming back our ends as the way to restore an out of balance strategic equilibrium. But there are also signs of computing views in his cabinet. So it remains to be seen which view will carry the day. Our new national security advisor will hopefully have a say in that. Maybe we can trim our ends a little bit, maybe fewer nation building operations. But I for one am not ready to give up on the global operating system just yet. It's simply too important to our national security and prosperity to just let it go. And in any case, the services simply don't control this. It's a political question. They just need to really, really understand the answer. So until the current administration's policy becomes more clear, let's assume for the moment the hardest case, and that's that the variable of ends will remain fixed. So that means the next variable in line for our consideration is that poor, long-suffering variable of means. If the security environment is deteriorating and our ends stay the same, then something has to give. Doesn't it make sense to just apply more means to restore balance? I would title this part of our discussion Irrational Exuberance. Or maybe it should just be titled Charlie Brown, Lucy, and the Football. Why? because of the yawning gap between the expectations that are being raised regarding increases to our defense budget and the likely real outcomes. Now, I was confirmed for my last job in the military as vice chairman five and a half years ago on the exact same day the Budget Control Act was enacted, so I know something about this. All the talk about a major plus up has gotten a lot of people in the services and in industry pretty excited about what we might do with all of this mana from heaven. There are two problems with this. First, does anybody here really believe that our Congress will deliver on this? We're talking about a major DOD plus up, a huge infrastructure project, a wall, no changes to Social Security or other entitlements, and a very contentious tax reform package. That sounds like a real deficit buster for a nation whose deficit is already 104% of its GDP. By the way, if you're interested, China's debt is only 44% of its GDP, and Russia's is only 18% of its GDP. Of course, we're hearing the normal bromides that will just become more efficient, and the economy will be stimulated, which will pay for everything. Maybe so, but a plus-up will need 60 votes in the Senate, which means eight Democrats will need to get some domestic spending love, and that doesn't even mention the angst that it's going to appear from the budget hawks. And don't forget that we're also entering the longest time that our nation has ever gone without a budget. If these people can't get their act together and their track record is not very good, we may even see a year-long continuing resolution. That would be a disgrace. Any company's board would fire its CEO and CFO if this were happening to them. 
serious strategists know, as Bernard Brody once said, that strategy comes with a dollar sign. I don't see this ending on a happy note. And in times of great budget turbulence, it's not wise to bet on a large increase. The second problem, if a plus up does happen, will be the overwhelming temptation to grow force structure first. This reflects what I would call each service's favorite identity metric. In the Army's case, it's numbers of soldiers. In the Navy's case, it's ship numbers. Now we know from our experience in many disciplines that measuring and then managing to the wrong metric can cause really bad behaviors. And service identity metrics are real doozies. One think tank recently came out with a suggestion for a 414 ship fleet, though they readily admitted it isn't possible even with a large plus up. But that is the offspring of a mindset. The Navy's latest force structure assessment recommends 355 ships as the minimum force structure required to comply with the strategic guidance, suggesting that we would pursue even more ships if resources were not a constraint. But resources are a constraint. Just a week or so ago, our leadership was testifying that we're flat out of resources for readiness. The media is reporting that over half of our Hornets are not even able to fly and that ship maintenance money is in the tank. And readiness is a major topic of this very event. The warning lights are flashing red here. What makes us think we can match a 29% increase in our number of ships with a commensurate increase in manpower and readiness spending while we're trying to modernize as well and then sustain all of that for the lives of those ships? We've seen this movie before. When lean times come in trying to keep up with, with demand from the COCOMs, we shed force structure last instead of challenging the demand, the strategic guidance. And Congress won't let us get smaller anyway, and then everyone blames everyone else when the force goes hollow. We're in potentially the opposite place now. In good times, the services tend to grow force structure back as fast as possible, forgetting that these things need to be manned and maintained. It's what led former CNO Vern Clark to say when talking about readiness in his day, we have understated the requirement and we have underfunded the understated requirement. Yes, we definitely need more ships, certainly more than we have. And yes, quantity has a quality all its own, but we really need ready and modern ships that support a modern warfighting concept. More on that in a minute. Thankfully, our Secretary of Defense has outlined a three-phase plan that will address readiness first, modernization second, and then force structure. And fortunately, our Navy leadership has echoed this, with force structure increases waiting for the third phase. Caveat emptor, friends, on that third phase. It's going to be very hard to hold the ponies back in Congress and the media and the think tanks. So if the security environment is deteriorating, and we're rightfully hesitant to overly trim our ends, and our means are a chocolate mess, then what about the only remaining variable, ways? I would title this part of my remarks the next failure of imagination. That's where the leverage is for us, ways. But I worry that we're just a little bit too stagnant in our ways, but I have to tell you that I was really heartened by what Admiral Harris had to say yesterday in talking about his version of ways. Ways live in three horizons of innovation, and I don't claim to have invented that term, by the way. The first horizon is where we make incremental technical improvements to our current concept. The second horizon is where we make out-of-the-box technical improvements, but still only to the current concept. The third horizon is where we rethink the entire concept. Recall that our 355 ship number is based on conforming to the strategic guidance, which means our ability to fulfill demand signals for both presence and warfighting. But this tends to lead to a self-reinforcing cycle. A combatant commander's concept for the fight is largely based on the capabilities and capacities that the services provide. And the capabilities and capacities that the services provide are largely based on the combatant commander's current concept and are also profoundly steered by warfare community DNA and ingrained beliefs. The result is that our approach to the A2AD I mentioned earlier tends to preserve the way we really want to fight by directly countering our potential opponent's efforts to deny those methods. This results in ships that are loaded with defensive systems. It results in conceptual equilibrium, remember that word, 
which in turn leads to demands for more forces and to technical incrementalism, where we work mostly inside the comfort zone of our first two horizons. Our nation's remarkable defense re industry is actually really good at this. They do what we ask them to do and are fielding superb systems, many of which are represented right out there on the floor. Candidly, there's even more we could do inside those first two horizons. Like, I'd love for Harry Harris to have one of those supersonic, sea-skimming, weaving, anti-ship missiles with a dual-mode seeker and its own DERFM capability. And I'd love to see a VLS capability on a, on a future LCS. But that would have made each ship cost more, which would have meant buying fewer of them, which would have threatened our ship number identity metric. But at some point, the world evolves to where the current concept supported by incremental modernization just doesn't work anymore. And we are at real risk of failure because the enemy has a vote. The question now is whether or not we can use our imagination to break out of that cycle before it really arrives on our doorstep. In his book, Surfing the Edge of Chaos, Richard Pascal asserts that in biology and in business, equilibrium is the precursor to death. When a living system is in a state of equilibrium, it's less responsive to the changes occurring around it, which, make it, which places it at great risk. In biology, this is called genetic drift in which a species naturally tends to refine its winning formula until an external upheaval occurs for which it is completely misconfigured and it fails. In human affairs, it's extremely difficult to buck this same trend. The rare people and organizations who do so often succeed wildly. Think of Michael Lewis's books, Moneyball and The Big Short. And for those who don't, catastrophic failure can occur. Just ask IBM which nearly perished in the 1980s by favoring mainframes over the rise of the personal computer, even though they saw it coming. As former IBM CEO Sam Paul Masano said when talking about crisis and a shortage of money, you spend more time arguing amongst yourselves over a shrinking pie than looking to the future, so you miss the big turn. As good as we are, are we beginning to miss the big turn? Are we now investing just to survive in an environment in which our adversaries are rapidly approaching the capability and capacity advantages that we've always counted on to overcome their advantages in distance and initiative, just so we can continue to chase our current concept? If this is us, then we need to get some people reaching for the third horizon of innovation ASAP. <clears throat> Pascal also tells us that the living things most likely to survive when threatened are those who move towards the edge of chaos, where experimentation and mutation are allowed to flourish and who are able to find fresh solutions. And that the survival of such a system depends on its ability to cultivate, not just tolerate, variety in order to shake itself out of its equilibrium. I suggest that we need to allow a little more chaos into our thinking. And from what I heard from Harry Harris yesterday, I think he would agree which is really important for a com combatant commander to say. Innovation happens, as Chris Darby, the head of InQtel, has said, at the intersection of courage and creativ creativity, when we're courageous enough to challenge all the assumptions behind our current operational concepts, and when we're creative enough to draw new capabilities from the synergies among disparate technologies, both existing and new, and when we light off a virtuous cycle between the new concepts and the new te technologies, the new capabilities. And when we're savvy enough to overcome the inevitable obstacles thrown up by our own system with all its many tentacles. And when we're bold enough to transition these things beyond the dreaming stage. And when that happens, if it happens, we have a chance to maintain our edge, to forge new dilemmas for our potential adversaries, allowing us to service anew the twin deterrent mechanisms of denying an opponent's objectives and imposing costs. And that going full cycle in our discussion will enable us to better serve both pillars of the ends I referred to earlier. In short, new ways give us the opportunity to make up for our shortcomings and the other three strategic variables. Now, our millennial innovators are going to deliver for us on this, but only if they're properly empowered 
In the process, we're going to need to divest ourselves of self-cost-imposing approaches and anything else that holds us back that consumes needed resources, as hard as that is. We're going to need to develop new ways to simulate with high fidelity the concepts and technologies that we bring forward. We're going to need to understand that nature favors the nimble when you're bringing forward concepts and technologies. And we're going to have to leverage the great platforms we're already building and start focusing more on really innovative payloads. Let me give you an example of some asymmetric low-hanging fruit. If you ask any naval officer what is meant by mine warfare, you'll probably get an answer along the lines of counter mine warfare. I actually tried this the other day, and exactly that happened. But what about offensive mine warfare? You would be stunned if you took a look at our current capabilities. They're not very good. But imagine what could be done with the state of the art of the technology we have today. Systems that are weapons attached to sensors rather than sensors attached to weapons. Systems with which we have two-way communications when we need it and that can even communicate with each other. That are able to understand the entire water column and have a state-of-the-art acoustic discrimination capability. That are really smart with sophisticated software that can accept library updates and instructions for tailored sensor reporting and selective engagement. That use modern battery and power generation technology to remain operational for a long time. That have a weapon that extends their range beyond shallow water and directly overhead and that are really hard to find. Seems to me that such a capability coupled to a diabolical concept for employing it would create a real dilemma for any competitor. But we're not doing this. Why? It's probably a combination of factors. There really is no sponsor who believes in it and will take money from something else to put into that. Maybe it seems like something that only a small, weak Navy would do rather than the most powerful Navy in the, earth, in the world. And some might wonder whether we would ever even be allowed to use it. But it would worry the hell out of me if I knew my adversary had it right off the coast of San Diego. That's just one example. There are others, but I won't touch on any for fear of treading on somebody's classified program. And if you think I'm being hard on the finest Navy in the world, you ought to hear my critique of the finest Army in the world. I'm an equal opportunity iconoclast here, and we need to do the work that I just talked about relative to all of our potential adversaries that Jim Stavridis told us about yesterday. And it's not easy work. As Liddell Hart said, the only thing harder than getting a new idea into the military mind is getting an old idea out. Getting to the third horizon will only happen with large minds in small groups rather than the reverse. It will only get done in an environment where people feel comfortable thinking not only out of the box, but all the way out of the convention center. It needs to happen everywhere at the institutional, operational, tactical, academic, and industrial levels. And our most senior leaders, the ones we have today, are the right people for this job. They need to know that we have their backs on this, that we're supportive of it, us old gray beards, and energized by and impatient about their need to rethink the entire problem, and that we're not overly beholden to our community prerogatives and the ways we've always done things, and that we won't complain if they take a little risk. That's why, again, it was so refreshing to hear Harry's talk yesterday. We need people like you in this audience to read and think about this and to take the personal risk associated with speaking and writing about what you discover. Send your ideas to Fred Rainbow and he'll publish them. Now, as I've said in the past, if the sea services were a stock, I'd be buying it. And when I wake up in the morning and I worry about four strategic variables being out of balance, I catch my breath and I think about all the advantages that this country has in geography, in demography, and diversity, and natural resources, and rule of law, and the finest military on earth, and the finest higher education. All of those things give me great comfort. But if we're not careful, we will soon lose our edge. We will not be able to maintain it. So let's break out of our equilibrium, and shake things up a bit, and get out to that third horizon of innovation in our ways as fast as we can. Steve Jobs once said, the people who think they're crazy enough to change the world are the ones who do. We have the smartest people in this business across the board, and they can do this. Let's empower them to do it. And that's what I have for you today. I thank you for your attention this morning. And now I do look forward to answering a few questions, or far more interesting to me, 
hearing a few of your responses and ideas. Thank you very much. Admiral Sidney Friedberg from Breaking Defense here. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, let me pull on the, th the thread here. You've talked very powerfully in general terms about the need for new ideas. You've given us one very interesting new idea about offensive mind warfare. Yeah. Uh, I'm wondering if you give us a few other examples of powerful new concepts that are out there, maybe or may not involve new technology, for other domains, other services, Mm -hmm. and you know, both give those specifics and then try to sort of come up overarchingly what is the overall new American way of war uh, that this serves beyond you know, the, our current second offset, as it were, that's being copied. Okay, good question. Um, again, I don't want to get into anything that I would risk uh, getting into a classified area because I've been away from it for a year and a half. But uh, you asked about other domains, other services. If you look at the recent RAND uh, unclassified study on conflict in Europe, it doesn't take long to realize that um, the adversary there um, is battle-hardened from Georgia, Ukraine, and even Syria, that they have singularity of command, one man at the top. They have um, internal lines of communication. They have state-of-the-art air defenses. They have state-of-the-art electronic warfare. They have the initiative, they are not bounded by the truth, and they have refined what we would call you know, little green men, and, and they even have the potential to do something fairly disruptive off the east coast of the United States with conventional weapons. Um, I would suggest that buying a lot more troops to handle that that are garrisoned in United States congressional districts is not the answer, okay? Uh, even at 2% GDP, NATO is not going to come up with what is required to defend itself. And again, part of the global operating system that has kept us safe and prosperous for 70 years is our support for the NATO alliance, which is terribly, terribly important. So I would tell you that, uh, yes, quantity has a quality all its own, but not if it's in the wrong place, not if it's not ready, not if it's not modern. I would say we need an army that is fast and is heavy and is modern and is ready. Now, I'm not an army expert, but I did spend a little time in Europe, and I have spent a lot of time in the joint world. And the only way that I can think of to do that uh, is to preposition a whole bunch of their stuff near the battle, keep it very, very ready, uh, keep it safe, keep a robust lift capability to keep a very well-trained force able to fall in on that equipment on very short notice. And that is going to require a smaller army because we've got to pay for it. I wouldn't take a dime away from the Army right now, but I would change their operational concept for winning uh, in Europe. Uh, but that would be anathema to a service identity metric. Um, I think it's going to take a lot of courageous leaders in that service to rethink that problem. I think Kurt Scaparotti is a wonderful uh, example of that. He's rethinking that problem now, I think, as, as I speak. But that's one example of where we've got to get way out of the box uh, uh, conceptually and break out of our current paradigm. There are others. Uh, the ways that we think about ballistic missile defense against uh, North Korea uh, and the like. Many, many technical and te uh, conceptual opportunities out there that we can leverage. Hello, sir. Uh, my name is Harry Larsson. Uh, I'm from Sweden. Hmm? I've been working 24 years in Swedish Armed Forces, but now work for an IT company. Okay. Um, I really appreciate your, your, your speech and all the other speeches I've seen this, uh, this week so far. Uh, but I have some, some reflections. Um, Napoleon once said that morale is um, to numbers as three to one. And when I hear those, those speeches, I, I have a sense that there's a lack of, I would say, uh, uh, cohesion between the administration, the new administration and the, and the military leadership, which could be to some concern, I would say. Um, so because the cohesion in your nation is actually the center of gravity when it comes to the power and what you can actually achieve. Um, so. From, if that's correct, so how do you, what's your opinion? How do you think, what, do you need to, what actions do you need to take in order to actually fix that so that you can have this cohesion in, in, in your nation that actually gives you the, uh, the power to actually do something? So you, I think to repeat the question is what needs to be done inside our, our government to have a, a cohesive uh, policy that would 
address some of the things you're talking about? Correct. I think that it's a matter of, uh, and again, I'm very apolitical, very agnostic politically, not going to make a political statement here, uh, but I would say it, it's going to take some seasoning on the part of this administration. Uh, I think having a national security advisor that's well respected, as uh, H.R. McMaster is, giving him a chance to do his work, you know, get off his back, he's going to need a little time to get his act together in there, letting him hire some people, and, and bring together a process that I've lived through the last you know, seven years of my life before I retired, uh, that, that is very, very valuable and very, very important for this country, where you can bring the expertise, the, the rich expertise that we have in, in, uh, in what is otherwise known by a negative term, our bureaucracy. There's some pretty smart people out there to bring them together to bear on the problems that this nation faces and have that process working for the president, uh, I think is what, what it's gonna take to deliver. I think we have uh, a, a terrific Secretary of Defense, we've got a terrific chairman, we've got terrific service chiefs. We're in really good shape in that, uh, that department uh, and I just, we just need to give it some time and hopefully these folks will forge their way ahead uh, with a little bit of leadership from uh, our new National Security Advisor and some pretty capable de uh, department heads. Thank you very much. Okay. And by the way, welcome to NATO if you ever decide to join up. Sweden would be a great partner. <laughs> Admiral, first I want to begin by complimenting you on the uh, talk about offensive mind warfare because that is definitely what, when we look at, uh, say, the East Asian scenario, that's definitely what we need. However, um, I would say that most people kind of think that in terms of new capabilities, which they would put under the category of force structure rather than maintenance mm -hmm. or... Uh, or ready, readiness or maintenance. So that's a, that's a tough part. Um, I, I can give you a lot of feedback, a ton of feedback, but mm -hmm. what I would ask for this audience is, um, we all know that DOD defaults to lowest bidder. In fact, the term used now is technically accept, acceptable lowest bidder. Mm -hmm. That doesn't really, um, it, it's not, technical innovation, mm -hmm. you know, will fund good, you know, extensive R&D. And how can you break that paradigm? Because you're talking about chaos, mm -hmm. you're talking about innovation. We all know that the reality of that is 10% of the people who come to chaos or innovative have wonderful results. And 30% are kind of tolerated mm -hmm. in the company and 60% get fired. How are you going to break that paradigm, particularly in DOD and particularly with all the budget focus, and we're gone to technically acceptable lowest bidder? Yeah. Not an easy problem. Thank you for handing that, uh, that to me. Uh, it's a problem that Jim, is, Jim Mattis, and uh, if he's ever able to get people uh, as subordinates in the Department of Defense, is going to have to take on. Um, I think you have to strike a, a good balance. I mean, there is actually value in a deliberate uh, cautious process for delivering some of the systems that we buy. Um, when you're going to buy a ship, you got to do it right. Uh, and if you rush through it, you, you could end up with a mess on your hands. But there are, I think, in the payloads area, per perhaps with the mine that you just mentioned, um, you could accelerate that process, uh, allow, empower people to take a little bit of risk in a process like that, give them the money to do it, and let her rip. And if something good comes out of it, then we will transition that. And uh, we've got, I think, pretty good uh, industry in place that's, that if you empower them to do that, they can make it happen. And there are going to be some ideas that fail, and we have to be tolerant of, of failure, both internally and externally. Congress has to tolerate a little bit of failure now and then. And I, I believe that's what Ash Carter and Bob Work were trying to do with some of the efforts that they've put forward with um, the uh, DIUX program. Uh, I'd like to see more IRAD given to uh, uh, or companies have more ability to use IRAD or defense dollars to actually do their own creative research uh, that's not exclusively driven by a requirements process. Uh, that's, those sorts of chaotic processes are what, what are going to yield the good ideas. And then we need senior leadership paying very close attention to what's going on with these programs so that when they need to step in, accelerate something, kick it in the butt, uh, put a little bit more money in, that they're there and aware of what's going on where the real high leverage programs are starting to emerge. But it's not an easy problem. I completely uh, get what you're saying. Pete. 
Admiral, good morning. Um, I'd be interested to hear your perspective on the joint requirements process in the context of your remarks. Mm -hmm. What needs to change there? You know, you've done a good job of saying the services have this self-view of themselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, my observation personally, when I was close to that process as a one star, mm -hmm. was that the service vice chiefs would often play not to lose in that form, but maybe not necessarily play to win yeah. together. Uh, I'd like to hear what your view is, having been so close to that um, as the vice chairman. Yeah, it's a good, really good question. Um, every vice chairman comes in and says, you know, I'm going to make this thing, you know, great, and it's it's not an easy thing to make great. I, I my personal take on it was I made it a lot smaller. Instead of having 150 people in the room, we had 10. Um, we took some requirements documents that were at 300 pages and took them down to 20. Um, although people tried to put annexes on to make them back up to 300 pages, but we said no, you can't do that. Um, uh, we tried to accelerate the process. We, we tried to do juons and geons a little bit more aggressively. So we, tr we did our best there. But I would zoom out of that and say the joint requirements process is not what is going to be the thing that transforms the military conceptually and um, technically. Uh, really what, what I felt that we were at the end of the day when I left the job was more of a gatekeeper to make sure that the programs that services wanted to bring forward actually were joint and that we at least gave some scrutiny to the possibility that a service that was developing one program and another service that was developing a similar program, maybe we could take 10% risk in each, each of those programs and bring them together to save a whole heck of a lot of money uh, in fielding the system. And we didn't usually do that because the services argued very hard that, no, I got to have that last 10%. Uh, but at least we tried. So I really do think that, that it's sort of a, uh, uh, a disruption in this business, new concept, really new concepts and capabilities are going to have to emerge from the smart minds that we have out there in uniform and in industry and in academia. I don't think this, you know, the joint requirements process, I think, will continue to be sort of a gatekeeper. But we got to make it fast. And I, the, the thing that I, I absolutely told my J folks that I did not want to be was the friction in the machinery, the, the sand in the machinery, you know, speed. Let's, let's get these things done quickly so the services can move out on them. Uh, that was really important. Sir. Sir, Bob Shea with FCA. If you were king for a day, what would you do about the interagency process, the total interagency mm -hmm. process, to play into those five key areas that you talked about before? Yeah. Because it goes beyond defense. It goes beyond the national security <coughs> advisor. Your predecessors, I know, and the chairman mm -hmm. previously have been very frustrated with that process. So I'd like to hear what your perspective on that is. You know, I think the, uh, that interagency process is actually, and this is going to shock you, uh, a pretty good process. It is really uh, how it is operated uh, that's in the hands of the, the people who are in charge of that process. And it works really well in some cases, and it, it's a little slow and cumbersome in other cases. And some, uh, and, um, for instance, you can have endless meetings on a particular topic if the answer is not coming out of that meeting that somebody wants to hear. Uh, okay, fine, we'll bring you another rock. Other times, it works very fast. And for example, I know there was some criticism out there of the process for um, approving special operations. We worked very hard on that process. It, you, know, you usually get the brief on a Friday night saying, we've got to execute this, and, and now you've got an interagency, you know, uh, people scattered all over DC. Um, if you've been fortunate in, in having a glimpse of that um, operation a few days before, you can pre-grease it. But there are some pretty important things that need to be covered at the strategic level before you can approve one of those things. And we, we got them down to a pretty quick process. Uh, but that takes hard work, and it takes uh, acceptance of risk and a comfort level from senior civilians who really don't understand that process until you teach it to them. So. Um, it really is in the hands, but the, the point is you have to have a process. I'm not sure that we've got one currently running right now, but I think that, that HR will get in there and kick that thing into gear very quickly. I really believe in the guy. I think he's going to do well for us. Um, but uh, it's really in the hands of the operators of the process. It's not the process itself that's broken. I'm great to see you again. Cameron Ingham, 30 years SWO, and now uh, yeah. a chance to stroll with Lockheed Martin. Thank you for those. Uh, yeah. Innovative remarks, great uh, remarks. 
So my, my question is bounded by two things. You commanded a battle group aboard of what is ostensibly the oldest carrier in service. Okay, but you still did a magnificent job at the start of that particular war. Uh, we particularly seem to be enamored with the next shiny object and, and oftentimes dismiss whole platforms or systems mm -hmm. well before the end of their service life. So where, where would you see, foresee the knee and the curve in being able to hold on to systems and modernize them Aegis weapon system is but one of those great examples that we see doing things mm -hmm. that was never originally envisioned for it to do. Where's that knee in the curve, if there is a knee in the curve, and when when do you, you know, cut your losses and move on to that new new item? It's, it just mm -hmm. seems like we could yeah. do more to modernize existing ships, today's mm -hmm. platforms, and move on before we just dart off to that next shiny object. Thank you. Sure, good to see you again. I think there's a... Uh, uh, a reasoned business case that has to be made to answer the question that you're talking about. And it goes along the lines of, um, to what degree is this platform upgradable with payloads that, are, that make a big difference on the battlefield? Can it be upgraded? And how, how expensive is it for me to maintain this platform uh, in lieu of buying a platform to take its place? And uh, what is the capacity requirement the real capacity requirement under, under a really valid warfighting concept where do I need to hang on to this thing even if it is, you know, if, it's, if you can upgrade it with good payloads and it's really expensive to maintain but I got to have the numbers, uh, then you know, I think there's a, a, a combinatorial uh, uh, set of variables in there that would answer that question for you. And I think, I think we're pretty good at that. Uh, the, the, the challenge is um, getting at the new concept that I think uh, is, is what I was speaking about earlier, and is rather than, than just refining what we're doing over and over, let's work to make this current concept work, by golly, and, and you know, we may have to hang on to a platform a little longer because we've got to make this concept work. Do that while you have to. Definitely do stuff in that first and second horizon of innovation, but somebody's got to be out there where Harry was yesterday. What are we really thinking, the exponential thinking piece? How do I get to that new concept where I may not need that platform at all? A new platform will do the trick. Um, and, you know, the platforms we're building today are great. Uh, they're just really good platforms. They're too expensive, uh, but, but it, it's also, uh, you know, we, we take a lot of, the industry takes a lot of criticism for the fact that things are expensive, but a lot of people who don't really understand that this is the most advanced technology in the world, and it's not quick to build it. Uh, there are mistakes along the way, and it's not cheap to build it. But I often refer to, to things like the LCS or the F-35 or whatever as going through their V-22 moment. Now, I remember back when the V-22 was a piece of garbage and it was a death trap and it was a terrible airplane, it was too expensive, and now we can't buy enough of them. Uh, our special operations forces love them. Uh, our Marines love them. Um, we're going to use it for a carry-on below delivery. And, and, and I'm, not, I'm not trying to sell V-22s. I don't think I work for that company. But, but it's just an example of, hey, you know, this is tough work and we've got to get through it. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, that was our final question for Admiral Winnefeld. Please welcome Lieutenant General Bob Wood back to the stage. Great. Well, uh, as I told you, this was going to be an inspirational speech uh, from a great leader. It was remarkable. By the way, Mary, good? Vote up. Good. Okay. It was an outstanding. Where'd you go? I've got an outstanding uh, opportunity to reflect a bit. Two things. One is we have a nuclear engineer who took that problem that was defined by Admiral Stavridis and described by uh, Admiral Harris, took that problem apart, put it back together, and gave us some very practical insights as to how it could be solved. Secondly, we have a, a combat leader with great experience, not only at sea and ashore, but also leadership in the joint world uh, that could really, with a reality check, give us perspective on how the problem could actually be accomplished and frankly give us a reality check on how difficult it would be. You inspired us, you gave our morale a, a good shot. Despite that question, I think he had it right, but I think your expertise is uh, valuable and thank you for bringing it to our, to our event. We have for you a book uh, by one of those warriors in the Army who would certainly agree with you uh, with regard to the prescription you offered, in this case to the Army. That's Scales on War. Bob Scales is, by the way, with us in the and Great. we'll be able to sign that book for you, and we have a, a bookmark from uh, AFSIA. Ladies and gentlemen, Great. once again, please give a hand to Admiral Winnefeld. Thank you. Appreciate it. Look forward to reading it. Thanks.
Thank you. We now break uh, 